Okay, um, this, is, this is the talk that's about my day job. So I have my grown up adult um, email address there. The Twitter account, anybody who follows me will understand that that's not a grown up work account. <laughs> um, to save you all taking pictures of this, if you go to ianturton.com, you can see, find the slides under talks. Um, they're not on the company website yet, because I don't know if we have a policy for putting web, web talk, talks on our website or not. Uh, plus the fact I only finished the talk yesterday. So I'm going to talk a bit about using OGC web processing services to move business logic to the server. Or making your web GIS seem smart or clever. So, you know, web GIS, it's what we do. This is, this, is our, this is our key product. It's basically a web map sat in front of a web map server. And the councils can add their data to it. I don't know what this is. Uh, something about bird strikes outside Gatwick. That's worrying. Um, there we go. Uh, <laughs> anyway, we can produce very pretty maps. So sort of base data on there. There's this area of where the bird strikes are. I don't think I'm ever flying out of Gatwick ever again, having seen that map. But suppose I want to do something a bit more complicated than just being able to click on the map and get some information back, which is pretty much all we can do with a web map. And you know, I want to draw a polygon. Well, that's fine. JavaScript will let me do that. In fact, one of the open layers demos lets you draw polygons. Um, it also lets you draw polygons like the one on the left, which is not actually a very good polygon. It manages to self-intersect three times. Um, but OpenLayers is quite happy to let me draw that, and it will let me try and drop that into my database, and it will then fail quietly, usually. And everybody comes complaining that they can't put any data into the database. Or you can see this attempt I've had at digitizing Illinois. I got bored very quickly before following the... Uh, the, the edges of the state, and I can assure you that if I got bored doing it, local government employees would have got bored much, much more quickly. So, suppose you want your polygons to follow the base map. I could download all of the local government, all of the uh, building outlines for the for the city, plus the roads, plus the poly other polygons. Um, to their web client, and about three weeks later, they'd just about get that map rendered and they'd be able to select things on it. But I want them to be able to do it to a WMS base map, partly because I, I promised the ordnance survey that I wouldn't let random people download their high quality base map data. I'd keep it safe in our database and only let them look at pictures of it. But they want to be able to click once in the middle of this building and have the whole building selected. Uh, it's apparently it's important for making planning applications and things. And then they want to add on bits of the buildings surrounding it. Um, or maybe I want to do some analysis. Um, one of our customers is called NSIPS, which is the National Strategic Infrastructure Planning Service, I believe. And they have to, when they come, somebody wants to make some natural infrastructure, so a new large wind farm or a new road, big motorway, say, they have to notify all of the people who might be affected by that application. So all of the councils, all of the police areas, all of the fire authorities, the internal drainage boards, the MSD, that's the army, the environment agency, the harbour authorities. There are about 30 people they're statutorily required to, to, to notify. But they only actually want to notify the councils that the road goes through. Or in some cases, neighbours of the ones that the road goes through. <laughs> and we have two levels of uh, authority, so I have to work out all the small councils, councils that it goes through and their neighbours, and then all the big councils that it goes through and their neighbours. And you can tell it's legislation, which is why they specify the neighbours and then what they must be neighbours to in one case, and then the other one, what it intersects, and then the neighbours. So the logic gets quite complicated, but it's legislation, you have to get it right. Uh, oh yeah, and they're sending me a zipped ship shape file, and they'd like back a zip file full of PDF maps and an Excel spreadsheet, please. Somehow JavaScript's not gonna cut this any longer. The JavaScript have said, 
I don't think we can do that. Pass it over to the server guys. So, in comes my web processing service. Uh, now, you've already seen three different people tell you this. It's an open geospatial consortium standard. It was developed in 2006, apparently. Um, and it's implemented by, amongst others, GeoServer, PyWPS, and the Zoo Project. Because um, I took the precaution of looking at who else was in this session before I, start, before I wrote my talk. Um, now, I used, as a GeoServer developer, I obviously used the GeoServer plugin. Um, but I could have used any of them. So I can write a process in Java, or if I really wanted to, in Python. But I choose not to, even though we're a Python shop. Um, and I can run it on my server, which means I can keep the Postgres database credentials hidden on my server without having to give them to the users. Uh, not that I don't trust my users, but don't try and let them have access to the database if they can avoid it. And I can have my web GIS access it asynchronously if necessary. And the original PIN specification insisted that we could do it asynchronously because their existing software, which ran on a desktop, took five and a half hours to produce these reports. So they were very keen that we could do asynchronous processes. Turns out this isn't quite as important as we thought, but uh, we could do asynchronously. And it's got a well-known API. It's well documented. I don't have to write the documentation for it. I can just pass the spec over to the, to the JavaScript boys, and they can read it. It's much easier. So, cool. So, processing WPS using GeoServer. Uh, it uses all the GeoTools and JTS libraries to implement your business logic. Um, it provides a drop-in way to allow remote access to that process. And it's brilliant. It's self-documenting. So I don't have to write any documentation for that either. It's better and better. Um, so basically, any thing I need to do, I can use my existing libraries for. Uh, I just write some annotations around the top of my process. So at the top, I give it a title. So pick an union. A little bit of a description. So return the union of the features that fulfill the provided fields that are in the geometry passed in. Result, the union of the selected features in the geometry. The type of thing you're going to get back, it's a geometry of some sort. I don't know what you sent me. It might be lines. It might be points. I'm just going to union it together. I don't care. It's a geometry you're getting back. And then here's my actual function call process. So it returns a geometry. It's called get features. And then it takes these parameters. So it takes a simple feature collection, uh, a filter that can be either CQL or OGC filter, um, an optional geometry to union it to. So if they've already selected something, you send me that geometry, and I will add it to whatever batches that filter. Uh, you can have, this was when they started adding more things to the process. There's an optional parameter that's called subtract, because they said, well, suppose we click on the wrong thing, and we want to take delete it. Oh, well, click on it again and set subtract, and I'll take it off again. It'll be fine. Um, and finally, an organization, uh, because there's some of our customers don't have permission to see the whole of the database. So we, speci we, we, we put in an, if they specify which, what their organization is, then I can check against a second database table to see if they're allowed to see those features. And I get to specify what the minimum requirement is. So the ones with a minimum of one are, are required. The ones with a minimum of zero are optional. And that's all the difference. That's the, that's the magic bit that get, wraps around my Java code. Uh, that makes it into a process. So I was quite pleased with that. So I compile it into a jar. So I just run maven compile, maven jar. Uh, drop it into a GeoServer web slash lib directory. Restart GeoServer. And as if by magic, it appears in the list of processes that are available in the web processing service. Um, and all of the arguments are documented because I've put that documentation into my annotations. Now, to be honest, it takes a little bit more than that because you have to debug it for a few days first before it actually works. But that's the principle. 
I could ship it to customers like that, and they wouldn't know. So GeoServer comes with a, with a GUI. This is our big selling point. We have a GUI. Uh, we have a WPS request builder. And you can see at the top here, I can select my process, pick in uni and get features. It then lists the inputs I need to provide. So I can provide a vector layer, or I can provide a um, JSON set of of as text. I can provide GML as text. I can provide a WFS remote process. Um, I can specify in here what my filter is. And you see all of my annotations are coming out at the top. That's my previous um, geometry. So it can be either text as GML or it can be GeoJSON. Fill in my organization. I can specify what I'd like my output to do. So I can do any of the outputs that, that GeoServer provides without having to actually code any of that. I just say, return this feature collection, and GeoServer takes care of processing it for me. So again, I can return it as GeoJSON. I can return it as GML. Uh, I can return it as uh, shapefiles, I think, even. <laughs> Could even turn the zip shapefile back. Oops. Too far. There's also, you'll note at the bottom of the WPS request builder, you can either execute the process directly, or you can do generate XML from process inputs. So that's what I did. Click on that. And as if by magic, I get a template file I can hand over to my, GOJ, to my JavaScript developer colleagues. And I've got a note in there that says, uh, put the filter here. Put your existing GeoJSON in this bit, and then post it to this, th this endpoint that I've given you. And it turns out they can do that. That's easy for them. They didn't even have to read the WPS spec. All they had to do was look up how to do a, an asynchronous as call to thingamajiggy, and I don't know, you know. They claimed it was hard, but I don't think it was. For the pins process, the planning system, it's a bit more tricky. So basically, I had to unpack a shape file, convert it into a feature stroke geometry, connect to the Postgres database, create a filter for each of these 30 different rules. I think when you got down to it, there were about 45 separate rules that could possibly be executed. Um, extract the matching features from the layers. Produce a PDF map. Well, I called right to a WMS at that point. I'm not messing around drawing my own PDF maps in Java. I've got a perfectly good PDF map generator sitting behind my server. Um, add an out a sheet to an Excel spreadsheet. Um, I used Apache POI to do that. So again, I didn't have to write any complex code. Uh, finally, I zip the whole lot up and notify the client it's ready. Now, you remember that the original system we were replacing we ran on a desktop. They only had one copy and it took about five hours to produce a report. Um, they were sometimes on big jobs, they would set it running on Friday and hope that it was still finished by Monday and that the machine didn't get unplugged by the cleaners. Um, so we had to do this asynchronously. Um, actually, I implemented it as two separate processes, one to upload, unpack, and copy the shapefile into a Postgres table, because I don't want to be messing around with shapefiles. <laughs> Uh, even if the customer is wedded to them, I don't have to use them. And then another one that actually creates a report based on that feature using a prepared template. Uh, so I have a long video that demonstrates this whole procedure that somebody worked through, um, but I couldn't convince it to play in Chrome. So if anybody wants to see it later, I can show it to them. Um, so this is what their PIN system looks like. As you'll see, it looks very similar to the system that we sell to local councils, except it says PINS GIS in the corner instead of iShare Maps. Um, but never wanted to write new code. Uh, so these red blobs are, that's a trans-channel power cable. The A3 one is new roadworks. Uh, this is a wind farm. This is where I live, so I can see this wind farm from my house. Uh, so I was quite pleased with that. 
Um, so that's the wind farm and the cable coming in. So at this point, the, 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 the analyst has uploaded their shapefile file, uh, and it has popped up. It's been put into the database and then displayed on the map. They can click on that. Uh, and you'll see that actually I'm running this on the test server rather than the production server, which is why I've got two results back, both of which are called ant underscore test. Um, we encourage them to give real uses. Um, but you'll see that there's an option here to call, call create report. They click on that. It pops up this JavaScript window. They type in their project name, the project ID, um, I believe that they have rules and complicated procedures for how they fill those in that conform to the legislation. We tend to just put our name followed by test and the date. Um, you can then select whether your report is for England, Wales, or England and Wales, because obviously we have two different levels of local government between the two countries, and some of these projects do cross the border. If they don't, then you can get a slightly co less complex report. If you got a cross-border report, you end up with about 60 pages, because uh, you have to consult with the, with, the, with the English Fire Brigade and the Welsh Fire Brigade, and obviously they're different. Um, you can also customise your report. You can uncheck these boxes, say, actually, I'm not interested in parishes, or I'm not interested in district councils. I don't care about canals, or I don't care about the army, that sort of thing. But in general, the, the users just pick which country they're in and click OK. So that generates a request, sends the execute request off to my server. I send it back a endpoint that it can poll. And it sits up there saying, generating report. And at this point, the staff were thinking, it's good. We can go and have a coffee. We can get some lunch. We can laze about. Uh, we've got five hours to kill. About three minutes later, this will pop up a little window that says, your report's ready now, would you like to download it? Uh, sadly, my, I was unable to screenshot that because it's a JavaScript pop-up, and my screenshot software won't actually screenshot pop-ups, but it's basically just a little box that says, your report's ready, would you like to download it? This is what you get when you download it. Um, so it's a variety of PDF maps and an Excel spreadsheet. You'll see that I haven't got all 30. Again, their previous system used to send them back 30 maps whether they needed them or not. I only send back the maps that actually have some information on them, because uh, it seemed like a waste of paper otherwise. Uh, so this one, you've got level one, two, three hasn't come back, four, five, six, seven's missing, eight, and then we get on to things like railways, ambulances, fire, police, hospitals. Um, low-flying aircraft, outstanding natural beauty, docks, electricity generators. Uh, and as I said, the maps are pre-generated using a template. Um, so it's got all of the required logo on it, title. Uh, it's got the name of the project, its number, what this map is about. It's got the Crown copyright license number so that the audience survey don't sue us for stealing their maps. Uh, it's got the red, red blob is the original planning application. And then in this case, it's got all of the pink, which are parishes, which are our smallest district of, uh, of electoral or responsibility, um, or community councils if you happen to be in Wales. Uh, and that, You'll notice that that's a, a, a portrait style map because it's a long, thin one. I also get back something like this, uh, which is the same thing, but this is for our large areas. So it's got the our counties, East and West Sussex, Surrey and Hampshire. The green one is the is the re, is West Sussex. That's the county I live in. And then the brown ones are the, are the surrounding counties. And the pink one is a South Downs National Park, which counts as a county, but obviously crosses other county boundaries just to make your intersects more complicated. Um, and 
just in there, you can't quite see it, but there's some blue blob, Brighton and Hove, which is a unitary authority, so it's not part of a county, but it does fill up the rest of the space. But again, you'll notice that this one is a landscape map, because the system took it took into account how big and wide the map was and said, oh, I'll make this one landscape instead of portrait. Uh, this is a spreadsheet. Um, I've actually got no idea whether this opens in Excel or not, because I don't have Excel. But it opens nicely in LibreOffice Calc. Uh, and the customer didn't come back to me to complain, so I'm assuming that it worked in Excel. Um, and then there's lots of these. There's 30 little tabs down here. And they list what are the hospitals in this case tells you which data set it came from, what the name of it is, and it's got the XY coordinates. They don't actually need the XY coordinates, but the old system gave them to them, so they said they should get them in the new one. So, in conclusion, looking for an easy way to make your web map application smart without tying yourself down to a back-end server. And to be honest, if GeoServer exploded tomorrow, we could no longer use it. I could recreate this in by WPS or in Zoo in a few days. There's nothing special about the fact I used GeoServer. Um, I would recommend you think about using WPS to move your complex business logic into the server. And as a reminder, the talk can be downloaded from ianturton.com slash talks. Um, I disagree with you because I think that having WPS uh, within GeoServer is something very special <laughs> because you can use all the power of GeoServer. Yeah, yeah totally. So, any other questions or comments? Oh, yeah, too many. I saw the first hand over there, but... Um, thanks for the talk. So. Um how customizable is the running the WPS on GeoServer where, uh, in, in comparison to PYWPS, for example? So I'm quite new to WPS in general, but now you had quite a simple task, geoprocessingly speaking, um, but how customizable is... Uh, uh, how do you mean customizable? I can so run any process I like, so anything I can code as GeoServer in Java, I can run as a process. Right, but I mean, now it was essentially an inter intersect with the parishes and the other layers. That's what. Um, it slightly more than that, in that I have to do okay. an intersect and then I have to find touching for different, and it's across three different layers. So anything, you know, basically anything I like, okay. as I say, and then I can put them into an Excel spreadsheet or I can put them into a P they can have WMS called a PDF. So any anything you can do with GeoTools or JTS mm -hmm. okay. or that you can write your own Java function for, you could do it. Okay. Or Python. You can, in fact, use Python inside GeoServer as well, yes. That is an option, but it's not a very efficient one. <laughs> uh, was here? Here, yeah, sorry. Hello, thank you for the presentation. Uh, the previous session dealt with WPS on QGIS server, mm -hmm. and it evolved a lot of dealing with infrastructure, the platform, and not with the business logic. So from those two presentations, uh, I may conclude that GeoServer in its current condition is as a platform suited much better than QGIS server with uh, PyWPS because actually what you demonstrated, you didn't deal with forking the platform. You just put your business logic code into and it played. Uh, can you comment on this? Um, Yes and no. In that GeoServer takes care of a lot of the complexities for me and it will create me a new thread for each process. So it's a new Java thread. Um, it's not giving you complete isolation the way that, say, a Docker container would do in PyWPS. So you could theoretically write a process that clobbered itself if somebody ran it twice. It's harder to do because GeoServer takes care of creating all the files for you and things in the background, and it knows what else is happening. But you've, so you've not got absolute isolation, but you've got thread isolation. So provided your machine is big enough to run several of your jobs at the same time, you've got, not got a problem. And obviously, we're running this in the cloud, so if there is a problem, we just put it on a bigger, bigger instance. Um, but as I say, they don't actually run this job very often, and the pins one, which is the big one. 
the picking features out of the map is a tiny little process. It hardly takes any memory at all. Um, so most of, the, most of the work goes on in the Postgres database, uh, and that's fine. So even when there's hundreds of people doing things at the same time, it doesn't really notice. Okay, thank you. It's very similar to, as you said, PyWPS default setup, and it seems to be working for most of the use cases. Mm -hmm. right, is there uh, any concept of state in the WS standard? As in, you know, you can only run this process at one. You can't run to. It's similar to what we were just saying, you can only run one process at a time or, or such No, processes. they're completely independent processes. Yeah. Okay. And you, as I say, you can either run them and wait for the result, which is what the toy picker does, uh, or you can run them asynchronously, which is what the pin service does. And then you just get an endpoint, you poll until it says, I'm ready, here's your results. This is the URL your result is at. So you, you, you can't really stop multiple processes running at the same time. No, the whole point is to allow multiple processes yeah. to run at the same time. Mm. I actively encourage customers to do that. <laughs> exactly. More? It doesn't seem to be the case, so thank you very much. Bye.